In the early 2000s, there were only really two ways to get your hands on the music you wanted. One, you could buy a physical CD, or two, you could go on some certain websites and get your hands on a copy of it. Music streaming, like we have on Spotify now, did not exist. If you wanted to get music, you could go to a website like the first versions of Napster and download it. Napster was a huge disruptor in the music industry, but it wasn't a typical secure download like you might do on an average website today. Instead, Napster used a peer-to-peer -peer network to allow users to share files with each other. So even though Napster technically used a peer-to-peer -peer system, this was not completely decentralized. Napster had a centralized indexing server, which was used to manage what content was available and where you could download it from. For example, let's say I wanted to download Baby by Justin Bieber. The server would tell me who had that song available for download. So I search Baby, go to the server, and instead of the server having to store the entire MP3 file, it would instead store an IP address or a location where I could download that file. Then when I make a request to actually download the file, I would be downloading from whatever IP address was specified by the central server, not from the central server itself. Once this operation was complete, my IP address would be added to the central server as somebody who has a copy of that music the next time somebody wants to download it. Now, while this was an absolutely revolutionary move for the music industry, it had a couple issues. The first of which is inconsistent performance. Peer-to-peer -peer networks are fundamentally not stable as different people are always connecting to and leaving the network and they all have varying levels of performance, varying strengths of computers, and you can't really trust them as much as you would trust a centralized server. The second reason is that Napster was not handling licensing properly for any of this music, so all of these downloads were completely illegal. Torrenting itself as a protocol or a peer-to-peer -peer file transfer is not illegal, but sharing files which aren't properly licensed is illegal. So while large-scale peer-to-peer music sharing platforms like Napster were shut down, that does not mean that peer-to-peer -peer file sharing for music completely died as a way that people get music. In fact, that scene is still alive today if you know where to look, which of course I don't. So, in 2001, Napster is officially shut down, and for two years there's not a great way to get online music, until in 2003, Apple launches iTunes. Suddenly, you can buy music completely legally. No more pirated MP3s, and you could keep the music on your device as long as you wanted, and listen to it as many times as you wanted after buying it once. Unlike its predecessor, Napster, which used a peer-to-peer -peer network, iTunes used a classic client-server model to serve music to the customers. Various clients all over the world, which were different devices, would make a request to the centralized server, which would then authenticate it, handle payment, and do all that, and then handle a single authenticated copy of the music directly back to the client device with the signature of the license. This was a huge step forward for the music industry, but obviously not without its fair share of problems. Buying music got expensive quickly, with songs costing over a dollar, so downloading an entire album could be over 20 bucks. That used to be a lot of money back in the day. Additionally, it was not easy to transfer your music from device to a device due to the way licensing worked, and you had to download all these songs so your device storage could quickly be filled up with just a couple songs and you couldn't have access to the catalogs of thousands and thousands of songs like we have today. In 2008, Spotify debuted with a brand new vision which completely changed the music industry and how you and I listen to music today streaming. But how exactly were they supposed to deliver a catalog of millions of songs to global users while maintaining extremely low latency to keep users happy? Introducing Spotify's hybrid peer-to-peer -peer model. They utilized both a centralized server and a peer-to-peer -peer network like their predecessors Napster to deliver music to everybody with as low latency as possible. Here's how it works. When you want to listen to a song, Spotify first checked the local cache on your computer. If it was there, you could just listen to it directly from the local cache. If it wasn't there, Spotify would make a request to their central servers to see if they could download that music from the server. That central server was using a similar approach to Napster. It had both the full copies of the song, which you could download directly from the central server, but it also had locations where you could download that song from in the peer-to-peer -peer network. If it saw another user nearby had that song already cached, well, it would just download from there, and we wouldn't have to burden the central server with another request. Now, how exactly did these downloads work? Because Spotify is a streaming platform, right? Well, kind of. When you listen to a song, it downloads the song in chunks as you're listening to it. So let's say you click on a song. It'll try to initially download the first couple seconds of the song so you get immediate playback and a quick download speed. As you listen to the song, it downloads more and more pieces of the song while you're listening. So it feels like you're listening to the entire song in one go, but in reality, you're slowly downloading a song throughout the duration of it. This approach was brilliant because it allowed Spotify to stream millions of songs with almost no burden on the central servers. And as more and more users joined and started listening to the same song, the network actually became more stable and efficient to a point. 
The first problem was one of the same problems faced by Napster, inconsistent performance. When you're paying for something like Spotify, users expect an absolutely clean experience, but when you're relying on downloads from different users who have different network speeds, it can be very inconsistent how quick these songs are coming in and nothing is worse than having your song buffer right as you're getting to the beat drop. The second major factor that led to the downfall of Spotify's peer-to-peer -peer network was the rise of the mobile phone. In a healthy peer-to-peer -peer network, you need a lot of users both downloading and uploading. In the early days of mobile phones, people only had 3G at best, which is extremely poor for uploading. So we would have a bunch of people just wanting to download from the system and no one ever uploading. So as more mobile phones joined the network and users wanted better and better performance, not worse, the shift to the client-server model became inevitable. Around 2014, Spotify began making the switch from their peer-to-peer -peer network to a full authoritative client-server model. But they didn't rely on just one server to handle all the traffic, they leveraged something called a CDN. A CDN, or Content Delivery Network, basically works by having distributed servers all over the globe. When a user wants to do something like listen to a song, well, they fetch that song from the nearest server to them, instead of just one Spotify centralized server way up in Sweden. Now, while this may have been a lot more expensive for Spotify, because now they had to pay for servers which were handling all the requests, by this time they had already captured a huge share of the market and people loved their platform. Additionally, because of the scale they were dealing with, they were able to negotiate much cheaper rates for CDNs. While Spotify may have killed their peer-to-peer -peer strategy, peer-to-peer -peer networks never really died. In fact, there's still some corners of the internet where they're very much alive. And the problems that Spotify had to solve with years of engineering effort without incurring huge server costs for things like a CDN are now just a button click or two away on platforms like AWS or Cloudflare. Thus is the nature of system design and software engineering. What were once the most difficult problems to solve in the industry are now just a button click or two away. Imagine where we'll be in five years. If you want to learn a little bit more about the basics of system design, I have a free PDF you can grab in my bio. Let me know what platforms or technologies you want me to cover next and follow for more.